Okay, welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to host Hamid Mohammadi from the University of Brussels. So Hamid is uh, an expert on thermo uh, quantum thermodynamics, quantum measurement theory. But in the past, he was, I think, you were an experimentalist, right? Like in your... Uh, well, uh, not an experimentalist. I worked with experimentalists. Yes. <laughs> so today I checked that you work on something which is it's called bismuth qubits. Yes. Right. So some some uh, spin qubits in exotic materials. That mm -hmm. like your PhD was about that. I think. Yes. Uh, well, well, not uh, too exotic. It's just silicon systems. Yeah. Silicon. To us, to us, exotic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Anyway. So. Uh, Right, and uh, after after the uh, after uh, okay, Hamid uh, did his PhD in uh, uh, University Coll uh, College uh, 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 London, and then he moved uh, as a Marie Curie Fellow to Lisbon, and then he spent quite some time further in the UK in University of Exeter, Lanchester. I think Janet Anders was one of your main. Uh, Collaborators. Yes, she's an Exeter. Yes. Exeter. Uh, then was a postdoc uh, fellow in Bratislava uh, until, like, okay, uh, I think just this year. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, now he's in Brussels and he'll be telling us about uh, like measurement disturbance and conservation laws in quantum me uh, mechanics. Uh, many thanks, uh, Hamid, for joining us. The, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so uh, this is uh, basically work uh, done in collaboration with Takeyuki Niadero in University of Kyoto and Leon Loveridge at University of uh, Southwestern Norway. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Uh, anyway, so and there's the archive link if uh, anyone's interested to read the paper afterwards. So basically, this uh, topic is a, an attempt to generalize the wigner araki yanasa theorem. So at first, I'll just give a very informal overview of what the theorem is about. And then I will start moving to the main content of the talk, where first I will describe sequential measurements, uh, and hence measurement disturbance, which is defined in terms of uh, when you measure one observable and then another after it. Uh, then I will talk about how the necessary conditions for the measurements of one observable, observable to not disturb another in the presence of uh, conservation laws. And then I will generalize uh, from these relations to the wigner raki and Asset theorem for unsharp observables. Okay. So what is the wigner iraki yanasa theorem? So uh, basically consider a spin half system uh, and uh, with the observable for the X component of angular momentum given by you know, the Pauli X operator, right? Now, if you want to perform a uh, ideal von neumann luthers measurement of sigma X, you can do so by a unitary coupling U with a quantum probe initially prepared in a pure state phi where uh, the unitary operator basically maps the eigenstates of sigma x tensor the state of the probe to the eigenstates of sigma x tensor uh, to orthogonal vectors of the probe, which we label phi plus minus, so that when you measure the probe with respect to the basis phi plus minus, you know that you've observed outcome plus minus of sigma x, right? Uh, however, uh, in 1952, Wigner showed that if the unitary coupling between system and probe conserves the total Z component of angular momentum of the system and the probe, then such a unitary coupling is prohibited. Therefore, a von neumann luders measurement of, Pauli, uh, of the X component of angular momentum is not possible under the conservation law where uh, the X component, uh, sorry, the Z components of the, the system uh, and the probe is conserved. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Hamad, can I yes. ask? Uh, you see, uh, it will 
<laughs> we we'll might have some questions in the middle. Sure. Yes, so uh, just to clarify some terminology, because mm -hmm. we have also some students in the, in the in the audience. So, like when you talk about von Neumann Luder's measurement, I guess you mean uh, not only like uh, measurement as a device that gives you like samples from the right probability distribution, but also you care about what happens to a state af uh, after the measurement took place. Exactly. Uh, yeah. so, so the von Neumann Ludus measurement is basically uh, what is always assumed in textbook treatments of quantum mechanics, right? You say you measure yeah. yourself as an operator and conditional on observing some outcome corresponding to an eigenvalue, the system yeah. collapses to the corresponding yeah. eigenstates. Yeah. Yes. Just uh, some people use like to, to refer to such processes they, they call like they use name instruments, right? Yes, uh, I mean, I, I will. So, so this part of the talk is just going to be informal. I will describe instruments and sure. everything later on. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> sure. OK, right. OK, so. Uh, uh, I guess, Jarek, Jarek, uh, so, OK, we have some technical uh, <laughs> problem. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Jarek. Uh, here on zoom but like your voice is kind of <laughs> modified in a very particular way right so maybe turn try to uh like log in log out log in again or reset i don't know right. so, uh, he wrote in the chat uh, saying sorry so yes Yes, there's actually a question from Jarek. He was attempting to ask, ah. I think. <laughs> okay. So, um, is this coupling prohibited or trivial? This was the question uh, for the previous slide. Uh, well, well, I mean, it's prohibited as in, so if the unitary operator commutes with uh, this self agent operator, sigma z uh, tensor identity apparatus plus identity system tensor sz of the apparatus, uh, then you cannot achieve uh, this uh, state transformation here. So, that's what I mean by. Ah, so it's the it's the second option that you are yeah. in, in yeah. that sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was uh, the original uh, observation or discovery by Wigner, which was then later uh, generalized into by Iraqi and Yanasa, and then the theorem is known as the Wigner Iraqi Yanasa or Way theorem. I will just say Way theorem throughout the rest of the talk because. It's uh, easier on the mouth. Uh, so this is the statement of the wave theorem. It says that an additive conservation law prohibits a repeatable measurement of any sharp observable not commuting with the system part of the conserved quantity. Now, a sharp observable is your uh, ordinary uh, observables in quantum mechanics uh, associated with self agent operators. But uh, I'll define it more uh, formally later. And yeah. And repeatable measurements, I will also describe, uh, um, you know, in terms of instruments later on. But if you go back to the previous slide, you see if the system collapses to an eigenstate of the measured observable, that is one instance of a repeatable measurement. Because if upon observing outcome plus of sigma x, the system collapses to the eigenstate plus, then a subsequent measurement of sigma x will is guaranteed to reveal outcome plus with certainty, right? Uh, so yeah, so the wave theorem basically generalizes this uh, observation by Wigner to arbitrary repeatable measurements of arbitrary sharp observables in the presence of an additive conservation law. However, uh, examples dating back to Wigner's original contribution show that approximately accurate and repeatable measurements can still be attained, given the conservation law, if the apparatus is prepared in a state with a large uncertainty or coherence, if you like, in the conserved quantity. And in this talk, we will basically see how these observations can be generalized into necessary conditions uh, for repeatability. OK, so, so now we can start with the uh, more formal uh, side of the talk. So in quantum measurements, we generally can consider measurements both as POVMs, positive operator valid measures, and as instruments. So an instrument, as shown in this figure, can be conceptualized as a black box with an input and output. 
So a quantum system prepared in an arbitrary state rho enters the instrument, uh, which then registers some outcome x as indicated by the position of a pointer. And thereafter, the system is transformed to a new state, a non-normalized state, where the trace of this object is now the probability that outcome X was registered given the input state row. Okay, uh, so an instrument is uh, can be associated with a collection of operations or completely positive trace non-increasing maps, which sum to a trace preserving operation or a channel. And the instrument is an instrument I is identified with a unique observable E, a POVM, which is a collection of positive operators summing to the identity via the re this relation, where IX star denotes the Heisenberg picture dual of the operation IX. So IX is the Schrodinger picture operation, which says how states transform, whereas IX star is the Heisenberg picture operation telling us how observables transform. And uh, so the observable or the POVM identified with the instruments is defined as the observable which uh, the operation IX star maps the identity to the effect EX of the POVM E. Now, if every effect E of X uh, in the range of the POVM E is a projection operator, we will call the observable sharp, uh, which is associated with self adjoint operators by the spectral theorem. And uh, any observable which is not sharp, uh, we will refer to as unsharp. Okay. Now, the probability of observing outcome X of observable E for the safe row is then defined as follows. So P row E X, which is the trace of the effect E X acting on row, which is your normal Born rule for probabilities, but it also equals the trace of the non-normalized post-measurement states Ix of rho, as I described earlier. And finally, just some bit of notation, which we'll see in later slides. Now, when you perform a non-selective measurement by an instrument, uh, as I said, you recover a channel, which is uh, given as the point-twice sum of the operations that constitute the instrument. So in the Heisenberg picture, we will define the channel uh, in the Heisenberg picture as I capital X star, which is the pointwise sum of the dual operations of the instrument. Okay. So now, equipped with both uh, the notion of POVM and instruments, we can talk about sequential measurements. So consider the following scenario where first you measure a POVM E with instrument I, and then subsequently you measure another observable F. Uh, now, since uh, the instrument I transforms the state row to a new state given by the channel induced by I, the input state for the F measurement is no longer the initial state row, but a disturbed state, right? So it should be seen that uh, the statistics of F will no longer be the same uh, as they would have been had an E measurement not taken place. Alternatively, in the Heisenberg picture, we can say that the statistics of F after a non-selective measurement by I will be determined by the disturbed effects I X star F. So you take the effects of F and you transform them by the Heisenberg picture channel induced by the instrument I. And now we can say precisely what we mean by non-disturbance. So we say that the observable F is non-disturbed by the instrument I if each effect F Y is a fixed point of the measurement channel Ix star, right? In such a case, the statistics of F for any input state row will be independent of whether an E measurement took place or not. Okay. Um, I refer you to this uh, reference by Teiko Hainosari and Michal Wolf, which describe non-disturbing quantum measurements quite well. Uh, right, so- uh, so Sorry, I, I didn't get what non-selective means. Uh, okay, so non-selective basically means that uh, you do not keep track of the measurement outcomes, right? So uh -huh. basically, you make a measurement, but you don't keep track of the yes. outcomes. So then the transformation will be given by the channel, which is the sum of all the. I understand. Yes. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you. 
Okay, sure. Uh, sorry, Hamad, can yeah. I ask? Because like sure. uh, what you present is very clear, just maybe for a bit less experience audience, like can you maybe, okay, I guess you don't have a choice just in words, like d describe how those things would look like on a s kind of simple example of like uh, Luder's measurements, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, sure, yes. Von Neumann Luder, like project, <laughs> standard projective measurements, yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. so basically let's go back to the uh, here. So we have an operation Ix, okay? So if, if your measurement is Luder's, then Ix row would be given by square root of Ex, sandwiching row on both sides, okay? But that is one specific form of measurement. And in fact, all instruments can be constructed as a sequential application of the Luders instrument followed by an arbitrary channel, right? Uh, so you can already see, maybe I should have mentioned this already, uh, while an instrument is uniquely identified with a single observable E, an observable E can be implemented by infinitely many instruments, right? Uh, yeah, so, it, uh, is that clear? Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Just because uh, maybe like uh, uh, just what I'm saying is that okay, like you you, you have this uh, non-selective measurement, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, it will be just kind of let's say defacing uh, defacing the state to the appropriate basis, sure, right? Yes. And then like if you have like two non-commuting I, I just wanted to give like this intuition to younger people like sure, when you have yeah. two non-commuting kind of projective measurements you'll get, get uh, you'll give a sequence of defacing uh, with respect to different bases and like the eff effect would be different uh, if you like uh, if they if they are not kind of the, kind of the sure, same sure. or if they yeah, don't yeah. commute right mm -hmm. that's yeah that's the like on a simple example what essence of what you are mm -hmm. yes uh, I, I, actually what you said is uh, going to tie into uh, the next slide which is non-disturbance and compatibility <laughs> okay so now recall uh, this definition right so we say f is non-disturbed by i if f is a fixed point of the e channel i capital x right now of course this implies that the measurements of e by i followed by f is a sequential, uh, it is a joint measurement of both e and f, right? And therefore, this implies that e and f must be compatible for non-disturbance to be possible, right? So what do, we, what do I mean by this? So non-disturbance of f by the e instrument i implies that e and f are compatible, which means that there exists a joint observable g with outcomes x, y, such that when you sum over outcomes y of dfx gxy you recover the original well you recover observable e and if you uh, sum over outcomes x you recover observable f so now of course uh, here or well, maybe i should have written this down but you can always choose if f is non-disturbed by i then you can choose the joint effects of the joint observable g as the operation i small x star acting on fy right because then when you sum over x you get the channel acting on the effect F, which non-disturbance implies that you get F back. Whereas if you sum over Y, well, you get the operation Ix star acting on the identity, which by definition gives you the observable E, okay? Uh, now, of course, as uh, Michal mentioned, uh, if you have, for example, projective measurements, or rather if the observable E or F are sharp, then non-disturbance, which requires the compatibility or joint measurability is only possible if the observables commute. And therefore, non-disturbance is only possible if the observables commute. Uh, now we can men, uh, describe the necessary conditions of compatibility or joint measurability in a quantitative form as follows. E and F are compatible only if uh, this inequality holds, right? Now, of course, if E commutes with F, the left-hand side vanishes, and so, uh, the observables are always going to be jointly measurable. And indeed, uh, you can always have a non-disturbing measurement of E, or rather an instrument which measures E and doesn't disturb F, which is precisely the Luders measurement, because a Luders measurement uh, doesn't disturb any observable which commutes with the observable that is being measured. On the other hand, 
uh, if either E or F is sharp, then the upper bound vanishes, right? Because remember, a observable is sharp if the effects are projection bound. Now, if E is a projection operator, then E equals EX squared. So this term vanishes. Whereas if F is sharp, then F equals FY squared. And therefore this term vanishes, in which case commutativity becomes necessary for uh, compatibility and therefore for non-disturbance. Uh, and this bound was shown in this paper by Takeuki and uh, his collaborator back in 2008. Okay, but uh, now of course, while compatibility is necessary for non-disturbance, it is not sufficient, why? Because we also have to consider the structure of the instrument that implements the measurements. So any restrictions that we impose on the instrument would impose further constraints on non-disturbance beyond those imposed by compatibility alone. And this is what we're going to look at now. Uh, and to do that, we have to look at measurement schemes, uh, which in the first slide, when I talked about the von neumann lulas uh, measurements involving an interaction between a system and a probe, now we can generalize this <clears throat> a little bit further. Now, a measurement scheme is basically a characterization how, of how a quantum system, which we wish to measure, interacts with a quantum probe of a measurement apparatus. So here, again, schematically, we have a system to be measured, initially prepared in an arbitrary state rho, and the quantum probe of an apparatus prepared in a fixed state psi undergoes some joint unitary evolution. And subsequently, we measure the probe by a pointer observable Z, where the outcomes of Z are in one to one relation with the outcomes of the system observable we wish to measure. And upon the measurement of Z registering outcome X, the system is transformed by the operation of the instrument we wish to implement. <clears throat> so we characterize the measurement scheme by this tuple here, where we characterize the Hilbert space for the apparatus the initial state of the apparatus, the unitary coupling, and the pointer observable. And the instrument, which is dilate, and the dilation of the instrument given the measurement scheme is given as follows. So the operation Ix acting on rho is given by, well, first you, yeah, the unitary uh, evolved joint state of the system and apparatus uh, with the project, uh, well, with the effects of the pointer observable acting well, either on the left or the right, doesn't matter. And then you check the partial trace over the apparatus. That gives you the state transformation of the system. And every instrument admits a normal measurement scheme, which is when the initial state of the <clears throat> probe is pure, uh, well, the interaction between system and probe is unitary, and the pointer observable is sharp. But it doesn't need to be a normal measurement scheme. We can also consider non-normal measurement schemes as well. But we're going to just stick to normal measurement schemes uh, for this talk because it'll make things easier. <clears throat> okay, so now we want to impose some restrictions on the measurement scheme, which will in turn impose restrictions on the instruments that we can implement and hence on the possibility of non disturbance. And the restriction we will be looking at is given by an additive conservation law. So we say that the unitary interaction between the system and the apparatus conserves an additive quantity n, which is a self-adjoint operator that can be split as a sum of self-adjoint operator in the system plus self-adjoint operator in the apparatus, uh, which is which commutes with the unitary operator, right? Uh, okay, so that's the conservation law. Um, Any questions sorry? so far? Um, this, this pointer observable z, is this related to uh... To, this uh, to, the, to those ends that appear in the additive conservation law or, or uh, not? In, in general, not, but I, I will mention how the pointer observable also can restrict measurements if it commutes with the conserved quantity. Yes. And uh, you mentioned, okay, you have this normal uh, measurement uh, scheme, right? Mm -hmm. Which is on the, on the figure. Uh, yeah. non not normal scheme would be like what like some different like uh, channel or yeah so uh, instead of a unitary coupling you can have a channel instead of a pure state for mm -hmm. the probe you can have a mixed state and instead sure. of a sharp observable a pointer observable you can have a unsharp pointer observable uh of course right. a, a measurement scheme is a measurement scheme for some observable with some instruments but yeah. 
if you it, it, it is only known that a, yeah. if you have a normal measurement scheme, then you can measure all observables with yeah. any instrument you like. But if you go to the non-normal case, then some measurement schemes can be precluded. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or some instruments Thanks. can be precluded. Right? Okay. Right. So now we wish to see how an additive conservation law will impose further constraints on non-disturbance beyond those imposed by just compatibility alone. And okay, so I'm not going to show how you get this, but uh, the necessary conditions for non-disturbance in the presence of an additive conservation law are captured by these inequalities, holding for every outcome y of the observable f. Uh, where here, uh, this term v is just the variance of the apparatus part of the conserved quantity in the initial state of the apparatus. Now, of course, if the apparatus is pure, this has a nice interpretation as a, a rather a large variance implies a large coherence of the state in the conserved quantity or a large superposition of many different eigenstates of the conserved quantity. But if the apparatus is a mixed state, then that interpretation doesn't cleanly follow. Uh, because you can have a mixed state which commutes with the, uh, the conserved quantity, but nevertheless has a uh, non-vanishing variance, right? Okay, so, so let's just uh, unca unca unpack, rather, what this inequality is telling us. So let's look at the left-hand side. If the commutator of the unmeasured observable, as in the observable which we measure after measuring E by the instrument I, if the commutator of this observable with the conserved quantity is a fixed point of the measurement channel, then the left-hand side vanishes, and so the conservation law does not prohibit non-disturbance. And it is easy to see that a sufficient condition for this is for the observable f to commute with the conserved quantity. Because if, the, if f commutes with the conserved quantity, well, this commutator vanishes. And because the measurement channel is completely positive map, it takes the zero matrix to the zero matrix, and therefore the left-hand side vanishes. But of course, while commutation of f with the conserved quantity is sufficient, it is not necessary in general. Now, on the other hand, if the commutator is not a fixed point of the measurement channel, in which case the left-hand side does not vanish, then non-disturbance demands that the right-hand side cannot vanish either, meaning that the uncertainty of the conserved quantity in the state of the apparatus must be large, and the square of the effects of F cannot themselves be fixed points of the measurement channel. Now, there is one instance where this always follows from non-disturbance, uh, which is when f is a sharp observable, right? Because non-disturbance, if you recall, is when the effects f are fixed points of the measurement channel. And if f is sharp, then f squared equals f. So f squared naturally is a fixed point of the measurement channel. So in that case, we can conclude quite trivially that if f is a sharp observable, the non-disturbance demands that the commutator of f with the conserved quantity must be a fixed point of the measurement channel. Now, of course, while sharpness is the simplest example, it is not the only one. Uh, so you can also have the, the, the same uh, relation follows if F is a rank one observable. So a rank one observable uh, is basically one where every effect is proportional to a rank one projection operator. Now, of course, if a rank one, so if a rank one observable is non-disturbed, then the projection operator has to be non-disturbed as well, which you can trivially show that it implies that the square of the effect is also a fixed point of the measurement channel. Uh, but yeah, uh, other restrictions also follow, which we can maybe discuss in the question session. So just to recapitulate, so unless the commutator of the unmeasured observable with the conserved quantity are fixed points of the measurement channel, non-disturbance is only possible if the measurement channel does not map the square of the effect to the square of the effect, and the variance of the conserved quantity in the apparatus state is large. Now, if you remember in the first uh, slide of the talk, I mentioned, or the second, I mentioned how examples show that re approximate uh, repeatability and accuracy were attained in certain examples, given that the apparatus was prepared in a large uncertain, uh, in a state with a large uncertainty in the conserved quantity, 
And we can already see hints of that appearing here. So now we can see how this general non-disturbance bound can help us arrive at a, uh, a formulation of the wigner iraqi and Asa theorem uh, as a special instance of non-disturbance. Okay, so now we can talk about repeatable measurements in uh, the more general setting. So recall that I said that when you perform a normal von neumann lewis measurement, where upon observing outcome X of a self-adjoint operator, uh, the system collapses to the associated eigenstates of that observable. Now, and I also said how it, such a case is a special instance of repeatability because if you were to perform a second measurement of the same observable immediately afterwards, you were guaranteed to observe the same outcome associated with that eigenstate. So a repeatable measurement is basically just a generalization of this. So we say a measurement, an instrument I compatible with a observable E is repeatable if repeated measurements by I, I based with I, I guarantee to produce the same outcome. Now this can be encapsulated by this equation where we say that the operation I X star uh, maps the effect E Y uh, to well the zero operator if X is not equal to Y and it maps the effect EX to EX when yeah, Y equals X. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and it is simple to see that if a measurement is repeatable, then it is a special instance of a non-disturbing measurement. In, in specifically, it is a special instance of a measurement of the first kind where a non-selective measurement of an observable E by an instrument I does not disturb observable E itself, right? Uh, so, in other words, the effects of the observable E are themselves fixed points of the E channel IX star. Now you can see clearly why repeatability implies first kinds, right? Remember, the E channel IX star is just a sum, point by sum, of all the operations of the instrument. And so, when for outcome X, you map E of X to E of X. And for all outcomes y not equal x, you just annihilate, annihilate the effect. So if a measurement is repeatable, it is by necessity also a measurement of the first kind, which is a special instance of a non-disturbing measurement. Now, of course, a measurement can be of the first kind while not repeatable. So and a simple example of this is a Lewis measurement of a commutative observable E. So a Lewis measurement of a commutative observable is always a measurement of the first kind, but it is repeatable only if the observable is sharp. Uh, now, of course, first kindness and repeatability do coincide in the special case where an observable is sharp. We should say that if an observable E is sharp, then an instrument I is a repeatable measurement of E if and only if it is also a measurement of the first kind. But in general, the two concepts do not coincide. And finally, I should also mention what the necessary conditions Sorry. for uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Hamid, I, I got a bit lost, so just sure, intuitively, I can, maybe yeah. I got uh, like th this rep re re repeatability of an instrument is like basically, I, I mean, just intuitively, is it just saying that, okay, I have one instrument and if I apply it twice, I, I'm, I keep on getting the same result, like yes, basically. Yes, independent of that's, the initial state of the system. Yeah, sure, 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 for like, yeah, yeah, for, exactly. any initial, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. For, for, for an initial state and mm. So, so basically, this in the first in, okay in this first equation, this e x or e y, this is a p of v m yes. associated to the instrument uh, e x, right? Uh, the instrument i, yes. I, I, sorry, yes, I, yes, uh, the, exactly, the yes. instrument i, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, right. So, like, can you give some example of some uh, repetible? the uh, instrument which is uh, not just uh, of the form i mean okay not a uh, not sharp von neumann measurement okay sure yeah okay so if the observable is uh, sharp and non degenerate as in all the effects are proportional to a pure state yes. then repeatability implies that it's the von neumann measurement so it, yeah. so if in the sharp case you have to have uh, the effects not be rank 1 
Okay, so, mm -hmm. so, so in that case, you can say, so basically, you can think of it this way. You first do a Ludus measurement, which then like collapses the system onto the eigenspace of the projection operator. Sure. But then you can do a channel which then uh, mixes the states within that eigenspace. So, so the state need not be uh. the same, it not be like collapsed to an eigenstate, but it remains within the projective subspace of the effect. Ah, yes. uh, right. Because yeah. do I understand well that it's more like you're not looking kind of inside the device, like the, the first equation tells you that the measurement statistics don't change exactly. rather than. Yes. Uh, we're not saying that the stage doesn't change. So, for example, right, I yeah. see. Ah, because <clears throat> yeah. So, so, so even ah, if the state was an eigenstate of the observable with outcome X, after the mm -hmm. measurement, it could go to another state, but it remains within the same projective subspace. Right, right. Uh, and, and, and also, I can we can generalize uh, repeatability beyond sharp observables as well. So, an observable admits a repeatable measurement only if it is discrete. So you can have repeatable measurements for continuous observables, but also all the effects have to have at least one eigenvector with eigenvalue one. So for example, let's say you have an effect which has <coughs> one eigenvalue, one eigenvector with eigenvalue one, but all the eigen eigenvalues are like either zero or some number smaller than one. Uh, then the instrument will be repeatable if it just takes whatever input state you have to that eigenvalue one eigenspace. So mm -hmm. it is still repeatable, even though it is not a sharp observable, right? Mm -hmm. So, but of course, gotcha. yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Just this, this. Okay, I, I got confused also about this measurement of the first kind. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, so again, so remember when I said a measurement of by an instrument doesn't disturb an observable f, only mm -hmm. if f is a fixed point of. The, e, the channel, right? Yeah. So, so uh, a measurement of the first kind is just a special instance of non disturbance where an E measurement doesn't disturb E itself. As in, you perform mm -hmm. a non selective measurement of an observable by an instrument mm -hmm. and then measure that observable again. And then the statistics mm -hmm. of the second measurements do not depend on whether the first measurement took place or not, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if a measurement is repeatable, then it is also of the first kind, but it can be a measurement can be of the first kind even though it is not repeatable except when an observable is sharp, in which case the two are equivalent. OK, thanks. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> OK, so we're, we're almost coming to the end, so we can I don't know, go back to any questions you have later. OK, so, so now we can basically look at the wave theorem for unsharp observables, uh, which basically we can arrive at by looking at the bound we showed earlier for non-disturbance. So OK, so remember, I said that repeatability is an instance of a measurement of the first kind, which is an instance of a non-disturbing measurement. So the necessary conditions for repeatability can be deduced from the bounds for non-disturbance, right? So basically take the bound I showed you in the previous slides where we had non-disturbance of, of an observable F given a measurement of E in the presence of a conservation law. And we just identify F with E itself, right? Pretty trivial, right? So this inequality must hold if a measurement of uh, E by an instrument I is repeatable in the presence of a conservation. But we can actually go a bit better than this because, again, I won't show you details now because it would take maybe a couple of slides, but maybe we can go into it in the uh, question session. If I is repeatable, then the E channel maps the square root of every effect to the effect, and it annihilates the commutator of uh, the effects with any operator A. So if I is repeatable, then this term vanishes, and this term becomes E of X. So we arrive at this inequality, right? And just a quick inspection of this bound shows you that we already have the wave theorem. Why? So assume that E is a sharp observable. So E X equals E X squared. So the upper bound vanishes. And therefore we see that in the presence of an additive conservation law and a sharp observable admits a repeatable measurement only if it commutes with the system bar of the conserved quantity. But now we can go a little bit further. We can say, what are the necessary conditions 
for an observable E to admit a repeatable measurement in the presence of a conservation law if it does not commute with the system part of the conserved form C. Well, since the left-hand side doesn't vanish, the right-hand side can't vanish either. So we arrive at these necessary conditions. So an observable has to be on sharp and the apparatus must be prepared in a state with a large uncertainty or coherence in the conserved quantity. And yeah, so you can think of this as a generalization of the wave theorem. And I should also mention that you can arrive at these, uh, this bound without assuming the normal measurement scheme. So the pointer observable doesn't have to be sharp. The interaction between system and apparatus doesn't have to be unitary. It just has to uh, conserve the additive quantity in a, a precise sense. And of course, the apparatus doesn't need to be in a pure state. It can be mixed. And, and now going back to what you said earlier about the pointer observable and the conserved quantity. So if you abandon the requirement of repeatability or indeed non-disturbance in general, but instead impose the condition that the pointer observable must commute with the apparatus part of the conserved quantity, uh, which is known as the Yanasa condition in the literature, then you arrive at the same inequality and therefore the same necessary conditions, but not for repeatability, but for measurability. As in, if the pointer observable commutes with the conserved quantity and you want to measure, just measure an observable that doesn't commute with the conserved quantity on the system, where you don't care about what happens to the system after the measurement, then again, you have to, you can only measure an unsharp observable, although of course, the unsharpness can be made as small as possible, if you like, if the apparatus is prepared in a sufficiently large coherence in the conserved quantity. Now, seen in this light, we can view the apparatus as uh, acting as a quantum reference frame, where we say that, uh, so uh, from the perspective that uh, absolute quantities measured from outside a quantum system must be invariant given the relevant uh, symmetry laws. And so the conservation law demands that the pointer observable, which is measured from outside the compound of system plus apparatus, must commute with the conserved quantity. And therefore, it must satisfy the NS condition, given that the conserved quantity is uh, additive. And uh, therefore, the apparatus serves as a good frame of reference, you know, some caveats, only if, it's, if it is initialized in a large superposition of the uh, conserved quantity of the apparatus. Uh, so here we can see that the uh, the Yanasa condition and repeatability play a very similar low, uh, role in uh, the necessary requirements that they impose on our measurement implementation. Okay, so just to conclude, so uh, we first defined what non disturbing measurements were uh, in sequential measurements, and we obtained general bounds indicating the necessary conditions for non-disturbance of an unmeasured observable, given that the measurement of the first observable is constrained by conservation laws. And we show that unless the commutator of the unmeasured observable with the conserved quantity is a fixed point of the measurement channel, non-disturbance is only possible if the apparatus is prepared in a state of large uncertainty in the conserved quantity. And in the special case where uh, non-disturbance is repeatable, uh, then we show that our general bounds reduced to a generalized quantitative version of the wave theorem for observables that need not be sharp. And that's it. So any questions? Uh, many thanks, Hamid, for, for a nice talk. Uh, uh, yes, we have time for questions, comments. Um, I might have one. Please, Tomek. Uh, where one would use a repeatable measurement? Like, what would be the point of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. OK, so I think one good uh, uh, point for using repeatable measurements is if you want to prepare a quantum system in a known state, right? So let's say you want to prepare a quantum system in an eigenstate of some observable. How would you do so? You perform a measurement 
And then you verify that you have prepared it in that state by measuring over and over again and verifying that it is in fact in that state. So that is one reason why you would want repeatability. Uh, and, and also, I guess, uh, at the point of the apparatus, so again, so let's, let's uh, consider that uh, you have a, uh, an indirect measurement scheme. So let's go back to uh, here, right? So, so it, let's say uh, the only systems you deal with, like let's say photons or what have you, the only way you can measure them directly is destructive. You destroy the photon. So, uh, uh, so, so then you would indirectly measure an observable by coupling your system with a probe, and then you measure the probe, which uh, destroys the probe, but then that allows you to prepare the system of interest in the desired state, but that requires repeatability. Now, of course, if the probe uh, is, uh, now in the case where measurements, even of the probe, are not destructive, in order to verify that you have indeed observed the outcome that you think you've observed, you have to be able to verify the outcome, right? So you have to measure the probe by the observable again and again to see that indeed you did observe outcome X not, and not some other outcome. So repeatability is often actually uh, demanded at the level of the pointer observable, which is one. Uh, so in the case where the pointer observable is sharp, which is usually the case, uh, that's uh, one justification for the anastic condition, right? Because we say, given the conservation law, uh, then the conservation law applies also to the pointer observable on the probe. And therefore, in order to be able to verify ex, you know, in your experimental setting that you indeed observe one outcome X and not some other outcome, you have to measure the probe over and over again, which demands repeatability, which by the wave theorem then imposes that the sharp pointer observable must commit with the conserved quantity, which is then the anastic condition, which then <laughs> translates to the measurement, measurability of the system observable. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Very much so, thanks. Thank you. So just a quick comment, uh, comment that this condition of uh, repeatability, uh, like maybe initially was proposed in like from classical physics, right? I mean, this is mm -hmm. how I remember from studying quantum mechanics at least, sure. right? Like that you, when you keep on interrogating your system, you're gonna, you're gonna get the same answer. Over yes. and over. Right. Other questions to Hamad <clears throat> or comments? Uh, well, I was just wondering about um, like so. These are necessary conditions, like yes, right for for well, for non disturbance and repeatability. But like, is there a way to kind of judge how strong these conditions are? Uh, you mean uh, okay, so. Yes, of course, yes, they, they are. So let's go back to this bound for repeatability. Uh, right. So yes, they are necessary conditions, but they are not sufficient. And of course, if you impose additional structure, then you can easily see that uh, commutation of the pointer observable with the, sorry, commutation of E with the conserved quantity will necessarily follow irrespective of uh, on sharpness or, uh, you know, the variance of the conserved quantity in the apparatus state. So if you remember, I said, if the apparatus is a mixed state, then uh, which commutes with the conserved quantity, it can nevertheless have a large variance, right? But if you have an apparatus state which commutes with the conserved quantity, and you have a pointer observable which also commutes with the conserved quantity, and you have an interaction which obeys the uh, conservation law, then by necessity, any observable you measure on the system must itself commute with the conserved quantity, right? So, so that's one uh, case where we, we see that this variance is actually kind of deceptive. So I, I think one thing which I should like to be able to generalize is to replace the variance in this bound by something that captures the coherence of the conserved quantity in the state, uh, in, which is zero if the state uh, commutes with the conserved quantity. Right. So something like the skew information or the Fisher information, something along those lines. I think that would be a more informative uh, bound. Uh, but of course, even if you have a pure state where a non-vanishing variance implies coherence, uh, there are still cases where commutation of the observable with the conserved quantity 
follow necessarily irrespective of what the coherence is. One case is uh, if you have a normal measurement scheme uh, and you know, given a conservation law and you impose repeatability and the Yanassa condition and where the observable is commutative and every effect E of X has only one eigenvector with eigenvalue one. <laughs> of course, this is a very restricted class of observables, but it allows for a simple way of proving that four such observables, so again, commutative, as in the effects mutually commute, and each effect only has one eigenvector with eigenvalue one. Because then the instruments that implement the repeatable measurements are going to be uniquely defined. And then you can basically show that repeatability and the elastic condition demands commutation of the observable with the conserved quantity. Now, of course, uh, I didn't really have much time to go into it into this talk, and it would get super technical. There are further restrictions uh, that must hold, which again are independent of what apparatus you use, uh, which are determined by the fixed point structure of the Schrodinger picture channel. So Basically, okay, the, the simplest case is when you say, uh, let's say the Schrodinger picture channel has a full rank fixed point. Then the fixed points of the Heisenberg picture channel will be a, an algebra. And all that really means is that given the conservation law, an observable admits a measurement of the first kind only if it commutes with the conserved quantity. Now, of course, repeatability implies first kindness. So the, comm uh, the commutativity with the conserved quantity naturally follows to the case of repeatable measurements in that case. Yeah, so, so, the, so there are many further restrictions. There are more restrictions that apply if you impose further restrictions on the instrument, basically. But what I've described, discussed in this talk were like the most broad necessary conditions that don't depend so much on the implementation uh, in terms of the fixed points of the channel, only in, the, in terms of the conservation law. Uh, was, was that clear? Should I uh, do anything more in depth? <laughs> <laughs> okay, any further comments or questions? Um, so uh, I, I was wondering uh, about like quantity, because I'm, I'm not following this field, but uh, what, what, what seemed interesting for me was a uh, uh, like quantity, Dative version of approximate way theorem, like mm -hmm. were those things proven already, or because or, I, I, I mean, I, maybe we did talk about it. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Uh, yeah, like yeah. what's the state? Oh, sure. what, I mean, yeah. it, it, there are other versions of the of a, a way theorem in terms of bounds. So Ozawa had a noise operator approach. So mm -hmm. basically, he also showed that. Uh, so, so given the Yanasa condition, uh, then the approximation of, okay, so, so usually the wave theorem is only discussed in terms of sharp observables, right? Mm -hmm. So when unsharpness comes in to the picture is only as a role of an approximator to the desired sharp quantity. Mm -hmm. right? So the wave theorem precludes a measurement of a sharp observable not commuting with the conserved quantity. So what you say is instead this, well, we measure an observable that's not sharp, but it approximates a sharp observable with some yeah. appropriate measure. And then there are ways of then showing that necessary conditions are like a large variance of the conserved quantity in the apparatus. But these approaches were not operational in terms of, uh, uh, so, so I mean, it depends what you mean, I guess, but uh, so, so here basically there is a version of these inequalities where I also have a error term, a disturbance term, which basically uh, has an operational meaning as the largest possible discrepancy between the probability distributions of the disturbed effects and the non-disturbed effects, right? So that has a clear operational meaning and you have an inequality in terms of the disturbance. And then when you say the disturbance goes to zero, then you arrive at these simple expressions, which are presented here. So, so in, in, in that respect, uh, I would say this is a different approach. And also in terms of the repeatability, <clears throat> here we, we aren't really considering an unsharp observable as, a as an approximator, but rather 
as an observable that we want to measure repeatability, yeah. repeatably, you know, a priori. So that is, I guess, another perspective, but I guess the way theorem has been discussed since the 50s, so uh, nothing sure. is that new. Sure, but I guess what I mean is like uh, you have this. Uh, okay, I forgot the terminology. Sorry, yeah. like there is a system that you want to measure, like yeah. in one P of M or another, yeah. and you have I don't know the this other system. I don't know the An lab, apparatus, let's say, yeah. apparatus, right? Yeah. So, like, is there a kind of precise mathematical sense in which okay, I do I do have this conser conservation law in place. But I uh, uh, and maybe I I cannot meet all the kind of condition. I let's say this sim like uh, I, I'm not meeting all those exact conditions. But let's say the larger the the, the apparatus and the I know bigger the variance, the the closer my measurement would be. So you oh, know. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So so I guess in in that case what. Yes, so, so so this stuff has been looked at. So again, this uh, was always uh, like noise operator approach. Mm -hmm. That again, so, so when you say a you want to have an apparatus with a large spread in the conserved quantity, yeah. that kind of means you need a large apparatus, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, so in, in that case, he says that the noise, like in terms of the root mean square error, like given the normal uncertainty mm -hmm. relations, but that yeah. can be made arbitrarily small by having a large apparatus. Uh, cool. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So there are other approaches which I guess are equivalent to this, where again you say, you know, given an apparatus with a large variance in the conserved quantity, uh, then the error uh, mm -hmm. between the observable you want to measure, which is usually sharp, and the unsharp approximator, you know, defined as the operator norm, uh, that can be made arbitrarily small as well. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, basically. So, so, so this inequality out here, where in, in the case where I impose the anastic condition, as in commutation of the points are observable with the conserved quantity. So, so this inequality is basically arrived at very similar, with, with very similar techniques to a paper by uh, Takeyuki Miyadera, my collaborator in this mm -hmm. project, Leon Loveridge and Paul Bush, where, uh, so it's published in JFIS A, and the title is something like a quantitative trade-off relation for absolute and relational quantities. I don't remember exactly the title, but yes. Yeah, so, so again, they say you want to measure a, a quantity on a system which doesn't commute with the conserved quantity uh, by measuring a uh, observable on the larger system of system and reference frame or apparatus, which itself does commute with the conserved quantity. And by, yes, yeah, so basically you can have a better approximation, the larger the variance is. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is essentially the same here. What is new here, I guess, is really the repeatability side of things. So, mm -hmm. so, so even if you don't impose the elastic condition, but just demand repeatability, you still get a quantitative trade-off, as we show here. Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, so we still have some time for to ask some questions to Hamid. Uh, um, um. Okay, then I, I, I just ask one last question. So uh, in this business, like what, for you, what would be the, let's say the, the next like exciting direction or like open problem you want mm -hmm. to tackle? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I mean, so, so one immediate open problem that I would like to tackle is basically arrive at a better bound than I guess this even, uh, where instead of having a variance of the conserved quantity in the apparatus state, we have something that measures more accurately the coherence of the conserved quantity in the apparatus. Mm -hmm. So the techniques we used uh, in this paper weren't sufficient for this, but so I, I think that would be one interesting direction. So we can precisely state that it is the coherence, not just the variance, that is what's important and what plays a role here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one direction. Other directions would be, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess uh, maybe going to like infinite dimensional continuous variable mm -hmm. systems. So of course their repeatability 
is not allowed, but non-disturbance can still be looked at in the continuous variable case. Maybe there we can find something mm -hmm. more, uh, different to what is already uh, claimed here, because in, in this, uh, these results are only related to discrete observables. So again, observables with a countable number of measurement outcomes. So for, I don't know, for uh, quantum optics experiments or what have you, looking at disturbance and conservation laws, I think there's a lot more technical work to be done there. Uh, and I guess in terms of the foundation side of things and interpretations, uh, understanding more clearly the relationship between repeatability and the anastic condition in terms of quantum reference frames, I think that would be an interesting direction because it, it just so happens that we get the same inequality for both repeatability and the anastic condition. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what is the physical significance of this accidental, you know, I identity, that would be an interesting question to look at, but maybe it doesn't really have an answer. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Uh, so can I just a like, quick question about on this, about applications. Maybe you mentioned this, but I didn't follow. Uh, so do, uh, do you have in mind some like witness, experimental witness for this inequality, or is it like just uh, the other way around that uh, you? Uh, oh well, well, the inequality is just yeah. uh, mathematics, right? So, I mean, either quantum. Well, no, I understand, or... but then uh, <laughs> if it's not fulfilled in real life, then it mean it means that the given experimental procedure is not re repeatable, uh, right? Ah, so okay. You could right, exclude sure. repeatability by witnessing well, well, this inequality. I mean, so experimentally, uh, you I, can. Uh, yeah. Well, 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 repeatability can be verified or falsified experimentally much more easily than. Yeah. So uh, okay. You just that's see if exactly it's repeatable or not. Question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's the other way around. And yeah, then, yeah. as you said, it would be uh, good to have some insight into this into this inequality uh, yes, yes. because then you know that you have uh, like if you check it's repeatable, you have this information, right? That. Uh, yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay. If there are no further questions or comments, uh, let's thank Hamid again for, for uh, his nice talk and uh, giving his perspective of uh, being able to measure physical quantities in the pre presence of conservation laws. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Many thanks, Hamid. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, the talk actually had some pedagogical kind of part in it, so it's, it's cool. Thanks. Hopefully, Hamid, see you uh, at some point in real life.